I do, yeah. <laughs> Nah. Why did you not leave the bridge? I thought I was going to So. I'm going to start here in just a minute. My minute's up. So my name is Danica Jones. I have sung, I have sung for you yesterday and uh, today let you know that this is about leads. Hello, is it leads you're looking for? Um, I imagine if you guys are in here, you uh, were intrigued by Eric's uh, kind of breakdown of ways that you can create content that will help you generate leads online um, and really help you create better relationships with people. Um, just to give you a background so you understand where my talk is coming from, um, I have been <laughs> on the internet for a very long time. I'm an internet, internet dinosaur. Um, I have been sailing the social seas for 20 years now and um, that's more than half of my life. Um, a lot of where I learned the things that I learned are not from marketing school. I don't have a marketing degree, I have a fine arts degree. Um, but what I have learned from 20 years of just being a part of an online community is that people at the very base of everything, um, data is awesome, it's really helpful, tools are really helpful. But at the end of the day, we're all just people. We have, you know, we have our hearts, we have our souls, we have our minds. We, uh, have basic needs and wants and all of the products that have been created over you know the past however many years have all been solving problems for people that had needs that weren't being addressed so um, lead generation is basically at the basic level to me about meeting somebody's needs and developing a relationship and offering a solution to a problem so uh, just when you strip it all down, you have, a, you have a solution to somebody's problem, you're reaching out to them, and you're educating them about why you have that solution. So that's how you get people to buy things. So you want leads. I want leads too. Leads are, <laughs> we always use this term, leads. Leads, leads, leads. Leads are potential customers. 
leads are consumers. We are all consumers in this room. We buy things, we use things, we look at things. All of the time, every day, as we're driving, we see billboards. We're consuming the information on these billboards. We're purchasing things at the store. We're eating kind bars. We're, we're having all of these brand experiences constantly. You are touching multiple brands as you are in this room, uh, using your Macs, using your PCs, using your phones. You know Everything that you touch is made by a brand, is made by people, is made by people solving your problems. So these are consumers seeking solutions. But the most important part when you're building a sales pipeline is to remember that leads are human beings. We're people. So we're going to talk about needs and leads. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to kind of talk about is this idea that um, and Tony Robbins spoke to this a lot, um, is this kind of idea that we have you know, some basic human needs that kind of bring us a sense of fulfillment and kind of like a purpose and we feel this kind of great sense of accomplishment uh, when those needs are met. So um, you know, all of those needs can be tied in some way to the customer experience. And I'm going to speak a lot to the customer experience today because um, I work at Consumer Affairs. Consumer Affairs is this consumer resource that uh, allows people to share their customer experiences with millions of people every single month. Um, and we learn a lot just from hearing those stories about hundreds of thousands of brands that are either delivering on point or failing to deliver. And the way that people research before they buy a product on Google, and not Yahoo and Bing because those are just silly things, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is totally true. I mean, you know, our demographic is largely, uh, you know, we, our organic search comes largely from Google. But uh, my point being that, you know, when we are thinking about a product, how many of you either go on Facebook and say, hey, I need to buy a car, like what are you guys driving, or you know, I need to go do this, what are you guys doing, you crowdsource, um, but we also go online and we research, we're looking for other human experiences to relate to and drive how we purchase products, how we buy things, it informs every part of our purchasing experience as consumers. So the first part about lead gen is this idea that Eric really touched on is developing this marketing that speaks to the needs of your audience. You're solving problems, right? So another aspect is that idea of placing messaging in channels where your target audience is hanging out. Um, you know, he said this idea of, you know, some of my audience is obviously not going to be on Snapchat looking for me, right? Well, you know, our audience is probably not going to be looking for our brand on Snapchat either. So um, when we create content, when we're creating content as brands, trying to reach out to an audience, we have to place it in the channels where these people are most likely to be hanging out. Another thing is this idea of, you know, you're offering solutions to your target audience's problems, wants and needs, you know, addressing those basic needs that we have and saying, I have a solution for you. So the six basic needs. How many of you guys know about the six basic human needs and have heard of them before? So there's a few people that are going to, I'm going to beat the horse, beat it dead. But my point in doing this is that, you know, really, we all have these needs. And I can tie them all back to marketing. And not only that, but after listening to so many of the talks yesterday and this morning, um, I can tie them all back to things that you guys have been learning so far at SM Tulsa. And it's important that you do that and be mindful of these basic human needs as you're going and creating marketing uh, communications because these things help create the sense of belonging in the people that are going to be buying your product, helps you build relationships. Relationships are trust-based. And trust is what gets somebody to keep coming back for more. So the first one is certainty. Second one's variety. We've got significance, connection, growth, contribution. So I'm going to kind of go over uh, two different formats here. The first one, I'm going to talk about some examples um, that go across these basic needs, but also kind of uh, talk about some steps that are involved in creating these experiences for people. So the first one, certainty. How many of you guys have a brand that you totally rely on? I want to hear like a couple names of brands that you know when you buy something that you are going to get the same thing every single time. 
Hydro Flask, okay. What was? Otterbox. Otterbox. What else? All right, so you've got your, your Androids, Android things. Android things? Apple. 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 Charmin. Charmin. <laughs> you know you're going to get the same tissue, right? Every time you know, you know and, and if you're particular about that kind of texture and the brand changes it, what happens? Hiroshima, right? Everybody <laughs> freaks out. When Coke changes the label on their bottle, what happens? People go bananas because they expect certainty. They want consistency. Not only do they want consistency, but they want something delivered uh, in a quality exchange. There's this uh, kind of concept of a, an energy exchange is what my hippie Aunt Tawny talked to, about when I was a teenager. And I'm like, Aunt Tanya, I don't understand what you mean. But <laughs> here's, here's what happens. You earn money every day. Your time is money. You have value. You existing. <laughs> Your time is precious, your money is precious. You've worked hard to be where you are and have what you have. When you take that money or that energy, that time, and you exchange it with a brand, you're expecting to get an equal exchange or a better exchange if you're a good investor in your, in your whole transaction with that brand. When you don't get what you were expecting from that experience, uh, we call it at Consumer Affairs a broken marriage of commerce. This thing happens where you didn't get what you wanted, but the brand got what they wanted, and there's this kind of uh, emptiness that happens. You feel like this dissatisfaction. Well, you know, I really was expecting a good customer experience. My product is broken, and the brand has my money, and they're not doing anything about it. So certainty is essential, not just in the product itself or the service itself, but it's also really essential in the marketing messaging that you're creating. You want people to know that what you are saying and what you are promising them is going to be delivered on time and time again. So before we buy, we're looking at brands' content. We're looking at that messaging. We're looking to people to see if they're giving us the information that may result in that sale. So um, in my case, I've been kind of uh, breaking up with a marketing automation platform and shopping around for new ones recently. And um, one of the things that I had been looking at is downloading lots of white paper content about the brand, about what they believe in, and looking for somebody that had the common ground that I needed and the messaging that I needed to say, OK, I'm going to invest this large amount of money in this product because they have what I need and they believe in what I believe. So. Um, you know, marketing materials need to have that certainty that revolves around the brand experience. Content libraries, um, and we've kind of heard this, uh, you know, talk of content over and over again. And content library is basically just your collection of everything that you have that is content related. Um, a content library is an amazing way to offer certainty and reliability to leads that are looking for the right information from you, and it gets the right people into your sales pipeline. So like it or not, even though we're human beings, we're still going to go through the little sales pipeline that Eric showed us. Um, and I'll kind of show you guys another um, non-Google pipeline and uh, encourage you guys to draw your own pipeline too, just so you can kind of understand what you're currently doing and, and kind of plot your course to develop more uh, tools and more strategies as you go along. So some examples that I really like uh, recently, um, HubSpot. How many of you guys have downloaded a HubSpot white paper before? Right? OK, so you guys know HubSpot. How many of you guys have purchased HubSpot? OK, right? So like we've got one person out of all these people. But here's the thing is HubSpot has you in their sales pipeline. They're hoping that at some point you will have this connection and say, man, their information is really great, but I need more. What do you need more of? Maybe you need more of their marketing automation tools. So um, it's really, you know, the content marketing um, allows them to market to you without exhausting a lot of sales resources and allows them to find the right people who are in the sales purchasing process at the time when they're ready to buy. And then they can start engaging those people in a more kind of uh, in involved format. But in the meantime, like you can download all the white papers you want and get lots of cool information. So that's really helpful. So lifestyle blogs, um, I, even though I wear the same color every single day and have no sense of style, 
I like to read fashion blogs. I'm really into it. In fact, my marketing coordinator, uh, Caitlin, she, she and I talk all the time about Gwyneth Paltrow's blog. I'm in love with it, and I have no idea why. This bitch is so snobby, but it's like, <laughs> I, I kind of want to be her, right? <laughs> I want to have $600 pants that I don't even, you know, get dirty and, you know, go farming at like locally sustainable things and have fancy dinners at places that are $700. Like I want to have those, it, like there's something really fun about the escapist aspect of going in and just losing yourself in a sea of things you can never have. So, um, but <laughs> my point being is like, you know, these lifestyle blogs are marketing content. She started as just a blog, right? And what happened is she was churning content out and people wanted to be Gwyneth Paltrow, right? They wanted to be a part of that world. Um, we love celebrity information as a culture because we want to lose ourselves in this escapist fantasy of um, something that we are not that allows us to kind of look from the outside in at this weird world. It's like a weird soap opera world where everybody's famous and they're dating each other and they're buying really expensive things and you're like, wow, that's a mess. But it's really fascinating. But I kind of like what they're wearing. I'm wondering if I can get that at Target too. And like, <laughs> a lot of the lifestyle blogs that are evolving are evolving into, I have a lifestyle blog. Oh, look, you can buy the things on my lifestyle blog, right? So Anthropology does this. Nasty Gal does this. She, I mean, she built a whole empire solving problems. She was an eBay salesperson. And you know, Sophia Amoruso basically just like built this empire solving people's problems. She was creating you know, this great kind of uh, wardrobe for women that wanted to buy really cute stuff and then started realizing she needed to have her own e-commerce site and then started building out a blog around you know, here's, here's where everybody's wearing it, here's who's wearing it, um, here's why they're wearing it, here's you know, the latest Coachella styles and here's what you can wear at Coachella with my fashions. Then she started designing her own clothes and started actually selling her own product. Um, Into the Gloss did this too recently. Um, they had this lifestyle blog where they were interviewing you know, famous New York women um, and men and asking them what's in, your, you know, what's in your bathroom shelf. I'm kind of curious about this. And they wrote this really great content. They were churning it out. And then the, the, um, the developer of this, this blog, Emily Weiss, she was like, well, you know, we talk about makeup all the time, but what I would really like is a makeup that does all the things that everybody's talking about all in one product. So she started developing her own makeup product and started selling. So she's solving problems as she's building her brand. You kind of uh, use the way that people react to your content to help inform and drive product production and service production. So you're able to actually use data, use feedback, use consumer feedback to continue driving the sense of certainty. So Intelligentsia does this business to business. Um, I love Intelligentsia coffee. Um, the Phoenix has Intelligentsia coffee here in town, but um, in LA it's like this weird cult thing where everybody's like, oh, Intelligentsia coffee, I'm gonna go there. and It's really delicious, but um, that's cool. They market to consumers. Obviously we all love coffee. We sponsored your coffee because we love coffee so much, but um, Intelligentsia has to market to people that are gonna sell the coffee to the people that are gonna drink the coffee, right? So. Uh, Intelligentsia does this with brew guides. They give you free information on how to properly brew an impeccable cup of coffee. And you're like, wow, this coffee company is showing me how to do this right. This other coffee company, I don't have a brew guide, I don't know what I'm doing. What if I get a bad cup of coffee and my customers are unhappy and they walk away? So Intelligentsia understands that they need to connect to both a consumer facing side and a brand facing side. So they're creating this content to help inform and drive the way that people interact with their brand. American Express does this with their open forums and their communities, right? So I don't know if, uh, how many of you are really active on LinkedIn, but one thing that I always notice every single day when I'm on LinkedIn is American Express communities popping up and people engaging on these communities. So um, they understand that um, you know, as a financial institution, they have to figure out how to engage people because it's a really high friction experience when you're engaging with a bank, right? They hold your money, they charge you for holding the money, and you don't always like the result, and sometimes it's like, oh, the man's got my money, and you know, you, you're, you're kind of in this weird kind of terse relationship with banks. So 
American Express is really trying to make this effort to um, you know, make it more than just a credit line. It's more than just a banking institution. It is about creating community and showing you what you can do with your credit line, showing you what other people are doing with their credit line. How are people being savvy using your product and allowing people to have this reliable space where they can go in and use this as kind of a resource. So the next one's variety. So I just talked about certainty. <laughs> uh, oh, to have all of these things together in once, right? Um, you can do this. You can do certainty. You can do variety. You can do them simultaneously. Variety isn't about necessarily just like the dread of the toothpaste aisle. It's about this idea of offering audience members something fresh. So. Um, if you have one white paper and you're just offering the same white paper over and over again, um, eventually people are going to get exhausted. Your leads have already come in, they've downloaded everything they need to download, um, and there becomes this kind of stagnancy in the sales pipeline. So um, lead gen is also about creating vi variety and diverse content to help continue driving people down the pipeline. If they get one piece of content or you blog once and then you don't blog for like 12 months or something, and they're looking, and somebody else is offering a variety of content, they're going to go to your competitor. So it's really important just to keep offering fresh content, new content, but in the spirit of consistency and certainty, offering something that is reliably equal in quality to everything you have previously offered. So some examples. The content library we talked about and that everybody kind of brings up, the content, content. So you're looking to offer a diverse array of content. So um, Eric talked about that being like expanding one concept or one topic into multiple forms of content. Um, it's really important because if you're able to take a topic and just blow it up and then divide it up into different content formats, you're really able to reuse a lot of this content over and over again and phrase it in different ways and you'll touch more leads by giving people a variety of options within which they're able to digest that content. So fresh content, right? Messaging consistently delivered. I know that when I look online that there will be a blog post on the blogs that I follow on a daily basis because I'm looking to that blog to get more information on a daily basis. So I know, like I'm like every time I want to go look at the into the gloss thing. Every day there's something new there. Um, you know, every, every day I see tweets from certain brands that I just know are going to be there online and be present and be aware of what's going on. So the other thing is just about new approaches, right? So you're offering opportunities for members to engage with your brand in different ways. So the next one's connection. And I think the thing that I want to ask here, not tell, is what sense of community and belonging can your brand offer to an audience member, not just during, but before and after the sale? So what are your brands currently doing to engage somebody? Uh, and Adam talked about this yesterday, this idea of the pregame. We tailgate, right? We have the gaming experience. And then after the game, how are you continuing to drive the sense of connection and, and help people feel connected even after they've purchased? You know, that, that person has grown your brand by becoming another customer. Um, that lead that is potentially a new lead, uh, that could be somebody that continues to drive your brand's growth. <laughs> wow, that was a good flip-flop. Your, <laughs> your brand's growth. So my point being that you have to always look at people as somebody that is potentially going to add revenue to your stream, um, whether that's somebody that's already a customer referring other customers to you or continuing to buy products, or somebody who's looking to you as a resource and they might become a new customer and add new revenue to you. So it's very important to just be aware of that. So some ways you can become uh, kind of community involved and connection involved. Uh, my Starbucks idea, this is like Starbucks one way that they've made me say, oh, well done Starbucks. I'm not a Starbucks fan, but I am a fan of the fact that they allow people an opportunity to share concepts. 
they're getting consumer feedback from people that use their product and they're saying, tell, tell us what you want to see. And enough feedback comes in and they're able to develop new products, which is variety. They're able to create a sense of connection with their, their customers because their customers are like, I made that. I made that happen. Yeah, how powerful is it to feel like you're driving the product development of this billion dollar corporation that probably doesn't even know you exist, but you have helped drive their product. So that's a very powerful connection that creates this kind of sense of like, well, now I have to go to Starbucks because I invented the product. I mean, I'm the one that helped dev develop this whole concept. So, um, you know, and it's, it's about that consistency, too. You know, every single time you go to a Starbucks, there's a format to how they make things. There's, a, there's an approach. So this is kind of about building on all of these basic human needs and, and tying them all into the marketing strategy. So Lego does this. <laughs> this is going to reveal my nerdiness. Uh, Lugnet, which is like this really cool online community for Lego builders. So um, <laughs> Lego, like you always think of Lego as like this kid space, but um, the cool thing about Lego is that it's, you know, Lego's for everybody. Legos are for people of all ages and their community online allows people of all ages to collaborate and collectively share their experiences, share their building <laughs> ideas, um, share what they've been doing to innovate and, and try new things with Legos. Um, and it's this really cool space that's just really simple. It's not attractive looking. It's a very basic website, but it really allows this kind of sense of community where you know that you can engage with other people that are of your tribe, of the Lego tribe. So it's, uh, you know, that, that creates kind of this consistent like, oh, I see what that guy's doing. I want to buy more Legos so I can do what he's doing. That's really cool. That's a neat idea. So Lay's does this with do us a flavor. <laughs> Um, how many of you guys have submitted a flavor idea before? Okay, Eric has. I have. I'm guilty. I, I kind of, <laughs> I wanted to do something weird like the chicken and waffles thing. So, yeah. I don't know. Like, you go to Asia and then you have, like, all these shrimp flavor chips and weird ketchup flavor chips. And you're like, this is great. I like weird things. So, um, but <laughs> Lay's, Lay's is doing this because it allows people to feel like they're invested in the development, just like my Starbucks idea does. So you invent a flavor, the community can chat about it online, um, they can share it socially across their social networks, and then the winners get made and you get to have this like sense of accomplishment, like I am part of this community, I have this involvement. <coughs> and BuzzFeed, how many of you guys read BuzzFeed? Yeah, yeah. If you haven't, you've probably looked at your friend who posts 3,000 BuzzFeed articles and you're like, I hate you, stop posting these. But my point being that BuzzFeed touches everybody at some point during the day, whether you actually engage with the article or not. And they rely, they are built on an empire of user-generated content. So Eric was talking about getting people to make content for you with like BMC Bear. Like, that is how they built this huge, huge business. They are relying on people to be a part of that community and have that connection with them and invest their time in generating content for BuzzFeed. So significance. We all want to feel important, right? You wake up, you go to work, you go home, you have family members, family members rely on you, work team members rely on you, friends rely on you. We all want to feel the sense of significance. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I don't always feel significance uh, when I'm having a brand experience. I feel insignificant often, um, and this often drives how I purchase. So that sense of significance makes me willing to pay more somewhere else to feel like I'm valued. Um, this is a huge part of lead generation. Um, customer experience is everything to lead generation. You are shaping an experience and offering something to somebody um, and that significance allows them to continue investing in your brand. That's huge. And then when other people can see it as they research products and they research brands online, uh, the memorialization of those experiences in organic search will drive the way people purchase. So um, for us, it's people sharing reviews on our site about brands that have let them down. You're searching in Google for reviews and complaints, and boom, consumer affairs is first for a lot of brands, and those experiences are the first thing somebody sees about a brand. So my point being that 
Um, every single customer is significant. Every single potential customer is significant. We are all significant and we all are important. And it is important to remember that and be mindful of that as you do everything that you do to message to people. So some steps. So step one, evaluate your customer experience and your customer service and review the way that you are seen in brand sentiment online. So kind of taking this personal inventory. What are people currently saying? What are you currently doing to make customers feel significant? Uh, make an inventory. So take, a, take some time with your teams, make a list, and list out everything that you can think of that you are currently doing to help customers feel significant. And then go online and inventory everything that you can find that people are talking about related to your brand or even your industry if you want to broaden it a little bit and kind of do some more uh, competitor-related research and just take the time to really expand on the topic. So step two, making sure that all of your messaging and everything that you're saying and communicating to people uh, reflects and aligns with those concepts and how you engage your current customers. So you want to make sure that you're walking the walk and talking the talk and that both of those things are, are one and the same. So you don't want to be like, we're going to deliver this amazing customer experience and all your current customers are like, well, that's not true. I haven't really, I haven't really gotten a good customer experience at all. That's terrible. So making sure that you've inventoried, you're aware, and that you're communicating that message. Step three this commitment to letting customers know after the sale that they matter. Um, I like to say, uh, you know, thank you for your feedback. You've helped me do my job better. So how can you communicate that gratitude to somebody and let them know that the way they engaged your brand makes you also feel a sense of accomplishment too. It's this collective sense of you know, helping each other out. So, you know, wow, I really appreciate you taking the time to be patient with me while we deal with your issue. This has allowed me to do my job better in the future. I really appreciate that. Growth. Everybody's here right now in Social Media Tulsa's conference to learn. That's growth. We're here to grow. We're here to expand our knowledge base. Um, you know, when you are just being a person in the world, floating about the universe, there are kind of three categories of knowledge. There's your known knowns. Those are things that you definitely are certain that you are aware of and you know for a fact you're, those are in your knowledge database. There are your known unknowns, things that you know you don't know. And like 80% of the rest of it are unknown unknowns. Like you don't know what you don't know. So, you know, you're here to grow, you're here to learn. And a brand, no matter what the brand is, whether it's a chamber of commerce or, you know, a product that you're selling to somebody that's a lifestyle brand, um, whatever it is, you are offering growth to somebody by giving them information. So make sure that, you know, the audience members are getting what they're looking for. Make sure that they're getting educated and getting a value out of that experience. On the flip side of that coin, are all of your team members actually completely empowered to offer that knowledge to people? How many people have sat down with an entire company and done training to educate people and advocate for this knowledge to be shared, whether you're the customer service representative that makes a very you know, modest salary, or you're the CEO that should be delivering the same message as that customer service representative making a lot of money? So it doesn't matter where you are in that company's roles. What matters is that everybody is empowered and advocated for so that they can all communicate the same message and help share that knowledge with people. This creates brand advocacy uh, within your own employees. This allows your brand advocates within your own company to share that message and help generate more leads. So, one of the first steps is basically, you know, you want to meet with everybody and make sure that everybody is empowered, even if it's just two of you or one of you. Sit down, again, take an inventory, and make sure that you feel like you're completely empowered to share knowledge with people that are asking about your brand. Make sure that you have a mission. Make sure that your mission is clear. Make sure that the messaging aligns with your mission. If there's any sort of sense of, like, you show something to a friend and you're like, 
tell me what I do from, from this messaging I'm giving you, and that messaging doesn't come clear the way that your mission does, then you need to sit down and reevaluate how you're communicating that idea. Step two, point one, craft messaging that educates consumers on your products and services. So Eric talked about this, um, you know, pretty much everybody yesterday talked about this. You're offering uh, information that gives people knowledge about the products and services you offer. Um, to take this back to the HubSpot idea, they're offering knowledge on marketing automation because that's what they do and that's what they offer. They offer content marketing driven um, marketing automation services uh, and lead gen services. So you're basically getting information about how to do those things in white papers, in blogs, in social media content. All of this content is driven to knowledge, to give you knowledge about this, this brand and what they are trying to do. Step 2.2 is to craft materials that expand on the educational aspect and position your brand as an industry knowledge re resource, so uh, thought leadership. So you want to make sure that not only are you kind of, you know, giving basic education, letting people know when you have product updates, new things, new, new stuff happening, um, you know, or trying to continue to expand on a knowledge database, but also kind of sharing your ideas conceptually with people in your industry and letting them know what you think is the future. Um, in our case, for us, it's been talking about video reviews because we really believe at Consumer Affairs that video reviews are the wave of the future. People are going to share more of their experiences in video format as we go through and get more video stuff. Eric was talking about Meerkat, right? <laughs> Another video app, right? So people are starting to get more and more visual uh, through their mobile devices, through their computers. They're trying to connect in a more personal way. People are seeking connection. People are seeking community. So they're looking for that face-to-face -face contact. Next one is contribution. How do you acknowledge the way that audience members offer things to your brand? After the transaction, what are the steps that you guys are taking to continue to let people know that those contributions have made a significant impact? Whether that's thank yous, um, whether that's gifting them with something random, uh, creating kind of wow moments with current customers to say like, we really appreciate you, we just wanted, you know, we heard you talking online and wanted to just reach out and give you a little gift and let you know we're thinking about you. Um, how are you doing these things to continue to allow people to feel really significant and like they're contributing back to the community? So engage audience members that reach out to your brand. These are people, you know, trying to touch your brand, trying to engage in a conversation. If those people are connecting um, in the sales land, they call them MQLs, Marketing Qualified Leads. So people are ready to like engage and get started. Um, they're people that are connecting with your marketing messaging and they want to have a conversation. If you fail to engage an MQL, that MQL will never become an SQL. If that SQL never becomes an opportunity, that opportunity will never become a close. So you are failing to generate new revenue for your brand. So listen online. The theme of social media Tulsa this year, by far, every single, every single session, every session, even the sessions I wasn't able to be in, I heard people tweeting online about listening. Obviously, it's a big deal. Um, David talked to this about this idea that marketing is broken, right? We need to fix it. The problem is, is that, you know, you get in this habit of a one-way conversation. And the one-way conversation doesn't work because everything that we do uh, is a dialogue in some format. Um, you know, my dialogue with you uh, is generating tweets because you guys are being polite and listening and trying to learn stuff. Um, but you're also sharing information. You're expanding on this dialogue with other people. So it's becoming this, like, you know, built out conversation among everybody. So everybody's dialoguing with each other as we're learning, as we're communicating with each other. So, you know, we really need to be conscious of listening and making sure that, you know, you're engaging people that are uh, reaching out to your brand, but also uh, reaching out to people that are just speaking to your industry or speaking to something that you can connect on. Because even if it's not necessarily directly related to your product, I see brands do this a lot. It's like, 
oh man, I could really use a cup of coffee, and a brand reaches out and they're like, man, we, we could too, it's been a really long week, and it's creating that kind of sense of, you know, you're part of my community, I want to engage you, I want you to feel significant, even if you just want a cup of coffee. And then, you know, post-transaction, letting people know how, how they helped. So we're going to get into a different layout now. This is going to get fancy. And if you've noticed, uh, where's, where's Lionel <laughs> popping up? Um, my point about you know, him as Waldo is this idea that you know, often we kind of see finding the target audience. Um, it's very much equivalent to kind of looking at you know, this mess of people in a crowd in a Where's Waldo book. And you're like, Ugh, I'm looking for Waldo, but I can't see him. And then you're like, oh, there he is. I know that's who I'm looking for. So, um, you know, let's tie Waldo into Lionel Richie and make it all connected. <laughs> um, so bringing it back to some Lionel Richie and Commodore's lyrics, are you the Cinderella for the, that fits the Leeds Crystal Slipper? What is your brand offering? These are basic questions that you should be asking yourself every single day as you're creating messaging. What is your brand offering? Who do you feel your brand will benefit? This is the persona. And this is one thing that I'm going to say that's going to expand on the persona a little bit is the persona is assumptive. You are assuming that a person that looks like that, has that life, does these things. You're assuming that that's the case. What you need to do is test that persona and look at the results and then continue to change your marketing and shift it to adapt to what the reality of that situation is. So we assume that, you know, in my case, I built personas recently with uh, a product team and we were talking about this idea of like, my persona was Dottie and Dottie was 75 years old and her son just bought her a mattress and the mattress just wasn't doing what she wanted it to do. And, you know, her son's like, well, you know, you should talk about it with the company. And she's like, well, I already tried talking with the company. So I had this like whole story, but how, how do I even know that Dottie exists? Maybe Dottie exists. I have to test that to make sure that that's actually the case. Because if I'm assuming and just spraying content out there in hopes that my assumption is right, what happens when you make an assumption? Make an ass out of you and me. So test it. Do the personas, test the personas, take that information, drive how you continue to shape everything. Who do you know your brand will benefit? We have certain knowns about things. If you're solving a problem, you can say, I know for a fact that I am going to be reaching consumers who are looking to solve blank problem. So take that certainty and then kind of start to shape how you build out those personas. So what are some pain points or needs of that assumed or verified target audience? So looking at your products and saying, okay, well, what is this solving? What are the pain points people really need to relate to and that, that they're really struggling with as they decide that they need to have this problem solved? And does your brand offer a solution? Do they actually offer the solution? And is that marketing communicating that you are offering that solution? <coughs> So will generating leads be easy like Sunday morning? <laughs> I can't answer this for certain, but I can say that quality begets quality. So you are putting quality out there and you will get quality results back. Again, ask yourself, are you the Cinderella? Know who you're the Cinderella for. So like, you don't want to assume that you're the Cinderella for somebody if the reality is that you're the wicked stepsister that's going to chop her foot off to get, get that sale. Like, you don't need to force yourself on somebody that's not the right person. You can wait for the right person to come along and continue to put that content out there and let those people come to you, but also take your time to reach out and let people know you're looking for them. So the sales pipeline grows when all aspects of marketing align. So. Um, sales and marketing, those are all, it's all together, it's all one thing. Marketing and customer service, it's all one thing. Everything is all together. You're marketing constantly. Uh, you're marketing through everything that you do. So let's talk a little bit about the funnel. Try to kind of go through this a little bit quickly since you guys have seen a funnel already today. 
So this is just one that I found. Um, I've drawn funnels myself. Caitlin and I have drawn many a funnel on our whiteboard while it works. So um, I picked this one because it kind of goes through all the different parts that Eric was showing to you on his. Um, and it touches all of those different things that I was talking about. Um, so the parts of the sales funnel. And I just kind of liken them to really basic stuff. So content, I kind of consider this arrows firing at targets. Landing pages are like flypaper. Once you get the content out there, you want to stick them to something that they're going to actually engage with, fill out a form, and get more information from you. So lead nurturing, this is watering the plant. So you want to make sure that you're giving something, nurturing your leads to make sure that they're going through the sales pipeline at their own comfortable pace, but being encouraged to continue along. The sales interaction, success. So a little success kid. But then after that, retention. So all of these together in a short form, tofu, mofu, bofu. <laughs> Top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel. The funnel can keep going. So say somebody's not really ready to buy yet, um, and they're kind of stuck in this weird space of like, lead nurture and things just aren't really happening, maybe they're going to go back through the top of that sales funnel again with some other piece of content because you're offering a variety of content, right? And maybe that, that journey is what takes them back through the, the funnel in a complete circle. So um, people can kind of go through this in different ways. Um, people cycle back into leads from opportunities all the time. Things sometimes just, you know, the purchase just isn't ready to happen. So it's really good to be mindful of that and know that there's this chance that that isn't a finite end. So the bottom of the funnel isn't always the bottom. Sometimes it just leads people right back to the top. Are you listening? So, <laughs> listening to me, thank you. Um, <laughs> engagement from leads can't be heard if you're not proactively listening for it, right? We are a very reactive culture. We need to be a proactive culture. It's time to start taking advantage of reaching out ourselves and listening to what other people are saying. Marketing has been very much this kind of, you know, TV just blaring at you. And it needs to not be a TV. It needs to be a radio, a two-way radio. And you're, getting, you're talking to each other and having this conversation. So social listening, huge. So we've talked about it like a million times this conference. I have been talking about it with my sales development team. Um, <laughs> I have this crazy idea that if you're listening to somebody having a conversation online and they say, man, I'm having a really hard time, this brand is really letting me down, and you're a competitor, and you go out to them and you're like, we're really sorry you're having that experience. You know, if there's anything we can do, let, let, let us know. You know, we're here, we're here and we're listening, and we, we acknowledge your pain, we acknowledge that you are having a hard time. Um, that's a strategy, it's a huge strategy for lead generation. For small businesses, it is a great opportunity. Because, you know, it's hard to talk to millions of people if you're this large brand, but it's very easy if you're one or two people or a handful of people to strategically incorporate this into how you are paying attention to uh, the industry, how you are paying attention to competitors, and how you're paying attention to the conversation happening around your brands and products and services. So this, specifically, is about catching people in their exact moment of need. This is very important. Listening also helps brands pinpoint uh, brand assassins. So we talked about this idea of negative feedback being uh, very uh, kind of popular in Google search results when you're looking for products and researching before you purchase. So um, this ability to listen allows you to spot people that are trying to destroy your brand and a complaint is a gift, gives you an opportunity to turn right back around and convert them into brand ambassadors or brand advocates. That's huge. <coughs> We're almost there, you guys. Hang in there. We're doing great. How can I generate leads all night long? Great question. I'm glad I asked it. So <laughs> this is the part where I talk about marketing automation. Um, we've talked a lot about content, and people are like, ugh. I'm just imagining having to create all this content. It's a lot of stuff. Um, marketing automation is fantastic. Um, I know Kristen spoke to a lot of ways that you can utilize tools to um, kind of facilitate and kind of ease the pain of having to continuously seem like you're engaging people. 
uh, marketing automation is very valuable. It allows a f person to fill out a form any time of day. They, you know, they go into your CRM or, or go into some sort of alert setup and it allows you to effectively uh, pick the right people to engage and triage the leads that are coming through. So, you know, maybe the guy that subscribes to your blog doesn't necessarily want to get a call at 5 p.m. while he's at his office trying to kind of find out information. But that person that did that whole progressive profiling thing, like, you know, by the time they filled out all their information, if you haven't called them, you're crazy. So it's kind of about being able to effectively triage. So I say consider automation if you have a large number of touch points uh, and a large number of lead inquiries. If people are asking already, um, it's really effective to take those people and bucket them into different segments and know that you can communicate with those people in specific ways and use specific targeted messaging to reach those people and better push them through the funnel. So not all tools are right for every brand. I broke up with a marketing automation tool because it wasn't right for me. What was right for me was something that allowed my sales dev team to more effectively take control of the conversation. So it depends on how you have your sales and marketing team set up. Um, I say that sales and marketing team, uh, you know, it's really important to be uh, kind of collaborating together on that and making sure that your sales and marketing team are both aligned with each other and that they all know that they have the same goal in mind and what their roles are to help push people along. So another tool that's cool is if this and that, I'm sure we've all kind of heard at some point uh, last year Eric's talk on if this and that was like exploding Angel's mind. She was like, what is happening? <laughs> this is incredible. And it is incredible. It truly does allow you to do a lot of content generation, sharing a lot of content in a more automated format. The little recipes let you, you can set up custom recipes. You can use recipes that already exist. Um, I recently shared some of my favorite recipes with a blog that was asking for some cool recipe ideas. So um, there's a lot of tools out there to help you continue to look like you're constantly generating content and continue to touch people even when you're in bed. So <laughs> how do I keep people <laughs> from walking out the door, right? So this is the part where I'm going to like bang customer service into your heads because customer service is a big deal. Uh, leads are more effectively generated when your brand is willing to align marketing with customer service. The minute that you admit that those two things intersect with each other is the minute that you have effectively transformed the way that your brand reaches people and markets to people. So part of marketing is reputation marketing. You're only as good as people are saying your brand is. Right? We're an online word of mouth culture now. So everybody can talk about your brand all they want. User generated content drives the way that people have this conversation about your brand. It markets your brand. You want to make sure that you're offering something that creates a good conversation. Consumers research brands to make smarter decisions. This is the crux of what we do at Consumer Affairs. What they encounter in organic search, what they encounter in social media, what they encounter through crowdsourcing their friends, um, all of this drives purchasing decisions. You have to ask your customers, are they happy? Did they get what they wanted? Consumer feedback and consumer generated media is not something that brands can ignore anymore. This is something very serious. I say it with a serious face because it is a really serious matter. Um, consumer feedback now influences over 80% of the way people are purchasing. So 80% of the people that are purchasing have had some sort of touch with reviews, have had some sort of touch, they've crowdsourced, they've asked people, they're looking for feedback. Everybody is making more informed purchases. So what you put out there and what you allow people to put out there by putting a certain kind of uh, experience out there for customers completely drives and alters the way that your brand can either succeed or fall off the map. Consumer feedback informs purchasing decisions. As consumers research online, we've said this, but consumer feedback is a great marketing tool for increased lead generation, right? So the way that people share about your brand, you research, you're looking up stuff, you're finding out information, you want to make sure that they're going to be sharing really positive experiences. or that if they've had negative experience, that you have done everything that you can to communicate that you're trying to help converting those brand assassins into brand advocates. 
So from our own website's data, we've got 7 million people and then some that visit every month and they're looking for information, they're shopping, they're purchasing. 70% uh, of those people that are visiting our own website are people that are researching before they buy a product. This is what they've told us. The remaining 30% are self-help solving their own problems, trying to figure out if other people are having the same experiences. They're looking for community. They're looking to relate their story to other people's stories. So this is very powerful. That's 4.9 million people that are researching before they even buy a product. The way that they read that feedback drives the way that they purchase. So to be a lead generation brick house, ask yourself some questions. Who are you looking for? You know, you know you're looking for leads, but who specifically are you looking for? Look within. Not to sound like a philosopher, but you know, looking within, making sure that marketing and sales are streamlined, that they're aligned with each other, that they're united. Uh, what does your funnel look like? Take time to draw your funnel. Draw your funnel and attach every part of the things that you offer to your customers to the side of that funnel and say, yes, I'm currently offering a blog, a couple white papers, blah, blah, blah. Here's my top of the funnel. Here's what I'm doing to nurture them. Here's what I do when we transact. Here's what I'm doing to do retention to make sure that I keep those customers. So messaging and customer experience need to be aligned. Opportunities don't always come to you. Sometimes you make them yourself. If a door does not open, take a chainsaw and cut the door open. Listen. So I totally stretched as far as I could in the world of lead generation. Um, if you guys have any questions, yes, cool. Um, if you don't think of them now and you want to send messages later and like ask me stuff online, that's cool too. Um, and you can connect with me. I'm kind of all over the internet, so whatever, whatever works, whatever floats your goat. So, um, yeah, questions? All right, well, thank you for listening. And do we know who's up next? Who's up next? All right, Roxanne. Ah, uh, that's a tough one to pick from. If you have two people on your team, split it up and learn from each other. So, uh, you know, Roxanne and Joel will both be talking about stuff that you can tie back to lead generation for sure. So, thank you again. I appreciate it.